You're listening to the King of the Fourth podcast, offering in-depth analysis on all things Boston Celtics with your hosts, Jim and Mike Quigley. All right. Welcome to the last and final episode of season two of King of the Fourth Quarter podcast. Um, Happy Father's Day. Happy Juneteenth to everyone out there. Um, and, you know, we're recording this on, on Father's Day, Sunday the 19th, and unfortunately we're not going to have a Game 7 to celebrate this evening as the Celtics um, were defeated in pretty convincing fashion um, they, on Thursday night, Game 6 against the Warriors, um, who really, over the course of the last uh, two games and half of a quarter, really... I think I'll class the Celtics in a lot of different ways and I'll play them and just we're clearly the better team, the more mentally tough team, the more resilient team. Um, the Warriors are much better defensive team than I, I think I realized they were going into the finals um, and they remain dangerous in transition, which we knew coming in. Um, you know, you look back over these last couple of games, there's, there's a lot to dissect. Uh, I think in particular, um, you know, if you're ranking things that went wrong, uh, you know, you start with Jason Tatum um, and his inability to really get going and insert himself into the series in any way, you know, that could have been a difference maker. Um, he was virtually a no-show offensively uh, in game six. Um, you know, I give him credit to continue to play good defense, um, which he did. Um, throughout the series, but he uh, he was a virtual no show in Game Six. You know, we can talk about the bench being an absolute no show. They got nothing out of the bench, and everything was needed out of their starting five, and that was just for two straight games, um, and especially at home. You know, you understand that happening on the road in the playoffs sometimes. That does happen to teams. It can't happen at home, and they got nothing out of Pritchard, White, and Williams. We can talk about that. And of course, as always, it's the turnovers. Um, and, and, you know, they were 20 plus turnovers in game six, uh, you know, turnovers in game five. And when the Celtics play like that, it leads to transition. It leads them to getting out of their strength with the, is their half court defense. And I think a lot of the turnovers were caused by the Warriors, but they're also caused by just bad offense. Um, a uh, lack of spacing or a lack of um, aggressiveness or the right type of aggressiveness or right taking the right shots. The Celtics continued to just dribble into nowhere. I thought at times dribble into a mass of people when they had, I thought, advantages to shoot over the top of some of these Golden State defenders. Um, and I, I guess that gets back to maturity, Mike. And I'll, I'll just stick with, I'm going to leave it at this last point. Um, there's a lot of talk, uh, I think, around here about Jason Tatum not showing the heart or can't be a winner. I, I think that's kind of a foolish conversation. I think his track record shows differently. I think what this exposed with him a little bit and with the Celtic stream in general is a lack of maturity. Um, he let them get into his head. He let their uh, Andrew Wiggins defense and the Warriors um, championship pedigree, for lack of a better term, dictate uh, what he was doing on the offensive end. You know, there were plenty of times, and, you know, we saw it especially late in the fourth quarter, he passed up a three in the corner, where he had the opportunity to insert himself and be aggressive, but there was just a constant second-guessing going on and constant um, indecisiveness on that offensive end. And he allowed them to really dictate the series on that end. And I, I think that's a lack of maturity. I, 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 th I think that's a lack of um, experience in, in that moment in particular. And you've seen it at times during the playoffs. But on the whole, you know, coming into this series, there's a lot of positives to take away from Jason Tatum. Um, and I do believe he's going to learn from this and bounce back. I truly do. And we can talk about, about that more in the pod. But if there's one thing you look at and you, it, Celtics fans have every right to be disappointed with was his um, lack of effectiveness uh, in, in particular yeah. that last game. Yeah, um, 
I apologize for my uh my three-year-old son is I don't know what he's doing right now, but he he might answer the pod. Um I just want to start off first. Uh, Andrew Wiggins was Andrew, the Andrew Wiggins effect in this series, just a shout out to him uh, on both ends. His rebounding, really, his his rebounding had such an impact on this series yep. to help the Warriors win, especially on the offensive board. Yep. Uh, his defense on Tatum was really good. I, I can't think of a player in the playoffs, the entire playoffs, that played Jason Tatum better than Andrew Wiggins. Uh, that's, that's just to, to see him play like that. Uh, in the amount of criticism he got for being an all-star this year, maybe we were just looking at the numbers and not paying attention to how good he was actually playing for Golden State this year. It, maybe that's what the problem was with the fans and discounting just how important he was to that team. And then his ability to finish at the hoop over and over and over again, whether it be a layup or a Don Curry, uh, turnaround jump shot in the paint. Oh, and, really- and it felt like in the and the biggest moments, whether whether it was in the fourth quarter or any run, just he, Steph, and then Clay coming off that injury and just showing them something. Really impressed with that whole that whole organization. I think what we can take from this is that the Celtics lost to the better team. And I think we went into it thinking that the Celtics were better. Maybe they were more talented in their starting five, but they weren't ready for the moment. And they certainly were not ready for Steph Curry. I don't think we can look at this series and say the Celtics had an answer for him at all. And so these things happen. As far as Jason Tatum goes, let's just remind everybody that game six in Milwaukee, he dropped 40, what, Jim, 42 points, was it? 46. Fine, 46 points on the road in game six to win that game. I assume he hit a lot of threes in that game, a lot of free throws. So let's not forget the fact that he went into goal to, he went into Milwaukee. Let me slow down. Let's not forget that he went into Milwaukee in game six and dropped, as you said, 46 points, where I'm assuming my memory's off that he probably finished at the hoop, probably hit a bunch of free throws, probably hit a bunch of threes, and played great defense. Yep. Game one against Brooklyn, he's a buzzer beater. So to say this guy is mentally weak and doesn't show up in big moments, he does. Game seven but against you cannot- Miami, 26, 10, and six. That too, yeah. right? I think we forget about that because of the way that Miami However, he wasn't good in this series, right? And I think he's getting a lot of criticism for it. We can say in one hand he didn't play well because he didn't. But to say also, you know, he's soft, he doesn't have heart. Now, that's, just, that's just a talking line for a talk show. It's not true. It's bullshit. At the end of the day, the Celtics just weren't ready for the moment. Jason Tatum let him down in the championship. The bench let them down. And they didn't win. But I think it's important for us on this pod, yeah, well, we got to break down game six because that's what we do. But we also have to look at the season in a whole. You came into the season without a point guard, and you finally handed the keys over to Marcus Smart. Now you have a point guard who's not only effective on the offensive end. Yes, he had a bad championship series, but all season he was good. And all season he was the guy who calmed things down and made the right play offensively. And he was Defensive Player of the Year. You extended Rob Williams at a perfect time because seeing the money that people are going to get this offseason, the money you got Rob Williams for, he's way underpaid. And to see his growth this year was important. And Jason Tatum turned into a superstar. So there's a lot of pauses you can take from this season. And there's also a lot of areas of growth that they continue, that we can continue to talk about. You know, there was a lot you just shared there that we can jump into it, but I think oh, some things that really stood out in this series with Tatum is maybe he does have to get a little stronger at the hoop this off season and finishing at the basket. That's something he can work on. He can work on his left hand a little bit more. Uh, J- Jalen Brown can work on his ball handling and traffic. That seemed to be an issue in Miami popped up a little bit in golden state. Uh, Rob Williams can finish work on finishing around the hoop and not bringing the ball down so much and on his jump shot. But don't you have all the confidence in the world that these guys and the progression that we've seen out of them, that they're going to do it. Don't you think that Jason Tatum is going to come back next year with a stronger left hand and finishing at the basket better? Don't you know that Jalen Brown's going to come back as a better ball handler? Don't you know that Rob Williams is going to come back as a better jump shooter? 
and a guy who doesn't bring the ball down on an offensive rebound. We've seen them progress over and over and over and over again. I think the moment was big. They didn't show up. And as fans, it's so quick to react that we forget what we've seen and we forget how young they are. So I think there's a lot of positives we can take from this. And also, to break this series down, they just weren't ready. They weren't ready for Steph Curry. They weren't ready for that Warriors defense. And they weren't ready for Andrew Wiggins. At the end of the day, they lost. Yeah, so I, I want to speak to the series, and I want to get into what we can expect for next year, a lot of the important stuff you brought up. Um, just staying with Jason Tatum. Um, you know, he led the NBA in the playoffs in points and assists. Um, he also, you know, led them and broke a record in turnovers. He also had the second most minutes um, over the last 10 years in the playoffs. To put in perspective, he had less than 100 less minutes than Kyrie had all season in these playoffs. He, you know, over since the bubble, he's had the most minutes of any NBA player by far, including playoffs. I think this was um, absolutely needs to get stronger at the hoop. There's things that part of his game needs to improve on. And he needs to remember what it's going to take to be a champion. And he needs to have this sour taste in his mouth, which has happened to a lot of guys, by the way, at this age. And I want to hit on him being 24 compared. And actually, this was year 23. He turned 24 late compared to other guys at 23. I constantly hear well, look what LeBron had it through in San Antonio. I, I around here they wanted to talk about him and Jimmy Butler. Look at what Jimmy Butler was at twenty three. He wasn't even averaging thirteen points a game. I, I I I think so. I think there was a mental fatigue, a physical fatigue, part of this. And Andrew Wiggins was great. The Warriors' help defense is also spectacular. And I think the Celtics got away from switching and finding a matchup that he can shoot over. And instead, we're trying to force the action into areas that just weren't there. You know, they didn't have a shot blocker, but they'd have three or four people just waiting for him. And not, and Draymond Green's an excellent rim defender, even though not being huge. He doesn't foul, and he does it well. Um, and I thought the Celtics made that mistake over and over again. We, we could talk about Jalen Brown's ball handling needing to improve. Because they but, did. Yeah. Right. And over and over. He, he continued to, at times, just put his head down and go to nowhere. And there wasn't an adjustment made to that. Um, there was a few times where it looked like he would dribble it out, read the defense, and they'd get something productive out of it. And that in the fourth quarter and third quarter for Jalen Brown, he was just shooting over dudes. He was just shooting over dudes and making shots. And he was great. But they didn't do that enough. Um, and, you know, they lost, and the Warriors were better. But I, I just look at this as there's a lot of things we can point to. I think the top three of Tatum, you know, getting nothing from your bench, you know, having to play in game five, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown the whole second half after making that comeback and not having anyone dependable to come off the bench to pick up any type of scoring load was huge. And, I, and so we go, as a player who's had this many minutes, who has this type of defense facing him, who's 24 years old, I do think there was a fatigue factor. People are going to say that's an excuse. I'm not him, so I don't have to worry about him making excuses for himself. I can say what I saw. And I, I think fatigue was well, he, absolutely a factor so. in what happened. Yeah, I, other people are making the excuses for him. He hasn't made any. When they no. when he was at the podium, they even asked him about his answer. I don't have one. Yeah. So I think Jason Tatum handled it like a man. Um, he knows he didn't play well. You could tell by the way he left that game. You could just tell. He, he just the way he was acting that he he knew. I I think he's it's, handled things really well. It's a great point by you, and this is where I have faith of his immaturity that we saw like driving into the, I'm talking about immaturity on the court, by the way, driving into a defense, oh, sure. turning the yeah. ball. That's mm -hmm. why I have so much faith. It's going to get better because he, the way he conducts himself in every other aspect of being an NBA player and his improvement overall shows a maturity shows that he is a mature kid. 
that is going to learn from this. I mean, we're going to see pictures of him working out in Deuce on a beach this summer, and you're not going to hear anything else about Jason Tatum. You're not going to see him on a boat or a banana boat with six NBA players like LeBron used to do. It's this is all. And who cares if he do? Yeah, but I I mean, this is all you're gonna. I I think there is a level headedness of this kid that um, I I think is meant for big things. Yeah, I know. Like I know people like to make fun of him about his obsession with Kobe Bryant, but who cares? I feel like obsession is real, and you know, Kobe's mentality was. My daily schedule in the off season it started at four a.m. It ended at six. I took a break. I was back at nine. And at noontime, I took a break. I was back at two. And then had a healthy obsession about or an unhealthy obsession oh, but, about Michael Jordan. You know, like yeah. it's all he wanted. To, like I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I don't either. And what I, the reason I'm bringing it up is because if, if Tatum really wants to be that guy, yeah, and that's what his off season will be like. Yeah. I, I think, you know, you brought up, you know, there's three things you want to see. I, the improvements we want to see out of uh, Tatum and Brown. I put Rob in there because I do think Rob can still improve into like. I should add an image of level. character in this series as part of the, but go on. I, I'll, I'll hit on that after. Um, the bench and then ownership is my third. I think you need to, as owners of the Celtics team, take a look at the Golden State Warriors and ask yourself, why are they able to stay this good for so long? Yeah, it's, and it's, it's because they spend the money. It's on not their apples and apples, so It's not, you're talking about one of the, I think we can hit on this a little more in the, uh, when we talk about improvements to the team, but we're talking about one of the richest men in the world that yeah. owns the Golden State Warriors. So, you know, if he signs, he, there's very few guys that going to be able to take on the salary that the Warriors are able to take on. We don't have to spend that much. We just no, have yeah. to use our TV and, you know, add to the bench and spend into the tax. That's yeah. what we're at. Add two more guys to this team. Yeah. Right. That's what we want. Yeah. And, and you hit on Rob. And um, I think last thing I'll say about the finals, unless you have something else to add, and then we can kind of talk. Um, no, go ahead. I, I, the lack of rebounding, um, Rob deserves all the kudos he, he should get. He, he played through, I think, a very painful knee injury. You, you heard about up until the finals, he was getting it drained all the time. Then he just said, screw that. What's the point? You know, and he got the treatment and he was, he was an impact player at being about 70 to 75%. Um, and he, he was a deterrent at the rim. Um, you know, he really helped their half court defense a ton. He wasn't anywhere close to the same rebounder. He wasn't the guy that was getting offensive rebounds and putting it back in all the time. And he, he was an inefficient to a poor defensive rebounder. You hit on Andrew Wiggins ability to rebound and you had Looney and Draymond do that too. A big factor in that is Rob almost being stuck on mud at times because he's working so hard defensively. He just couldn't muster up the, the strength in that knee to do what he needed to do defensively and then rebound as well. Um, I, I think, I think it's too bad for the Celtics, obviously that he wasn't a hundred percent. I also think it's really too bad for the average NBA fan that they did not get to see this guy oh. at his full ability. And I, oh, wow. I, I don't think the the average fan, I think the league probably is starting to realize just how um, wonderful a player he is. You know, and so I You'll think see it in the draft. factor and them not being a better team. And, you know, people like to point to Middleton with the Bucks and stuff. I, I think Rob's injury has really been underestimated both locally and nationally of how much this impacted the, the Celtics in the playoffs. Yeah, it's a really good point, Jim. I think that fans didn't get to see. You know, I, you know after your regular dedicated Celtics fans got to see this with Rob this year pre-injury, but most fans nationally didn't get to see how good this kid really is. I think the NBA is caught up to what he is, and I think you're going to see it on draft night. I think you're going to see teams reaching for Rob Williams-type players internationally and all around because that's 
that's the way every sport is. They don't grow on trees. This isn't. No, they don't. He's special. You know, they don't grow on trees. And the biggest thing with him is what we've been talking about for years. It's 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 his health and how they maintain that and how they. You just hope you're afraid of that he's built like a guy that's built to be injured. Yeah, I don't know. I I think I, I would assume he's not gonna play in the preseason. I'm gonna assume even the start of the year, I don't care if he misses the first couple months. I would I would sign centers just to be on the roster so I can sit Rob as much as possible next year. That's what I would do. I I, I would. I mean I think they can win games in the regular season without him and just manage his minutes and then the following season get back to And I understand that. I, I'm just wondering, so his injuries the last two years was a turf toe. That isn't a wear and tear injury. And then was a MCL injury where he landed awkwardly. Uh, mm-hmm. these, these aren't injuries based off of rest. These are injuries that the reason I'm the course of doing business. And so are we I trying to avoid something you can't avoid, I guess is what I'm saying. No, I hear you. I'm just wondering if he did further damage to that MCL by playing as much as he did in this playoff run. I, I hope not. And what I've read, um, you know, and I did most of the reading when he first got hurt, is that you can come back and play. The question is whether you play or not how much that MCL sticks with you regardless going forward, <laughs> how much that injury um, is more likely to be re-injured or hamper your play right? in, that the, would be, in yeah. the seasons in the seasons to come. So like what I read, it wasn't a matter of like, okay, he gets the surgery, comes back, fine. That really doesn't have much to do with what happens later. Um, you're kind of in the same boat. So that that in itself wasn't promising. Um, you know, the window on Rob probably isn't huge. We're probably talking three, four years of really good basketball. What it looks like after that, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, it'd be great if they could ever have a playoff run with him healthy. The sky's the limit on on this team. It really is. The sky's the limit. And I think this is a good kind of segue and you've hit on it a ton already. And even without him healthy, if they didn't just showed up, we're probably looking at a game seven. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I get over the fact that Tatum didn't even shoot a free throw in game six. That's how bad he was. Yeah, he was, he was really bad. There was no doubt. Um, but I, I think him being bad, Rob, they also were in this position because they were both so great. And this season, they were 18 and 21. Um, You know, we were doing pods where we just wanted them to get into the playoffs, have a competitive round, you know, something to feel good about themselves. Jimmy, I was kind of thinking the Salem was. Jimmy, I wanted them to shut down Tatum and Brown so they could get into the lottery. (laughs) (laughs) That's I said that on the pod. I was so mad and sick of the team. I was like, just shut them down and get a third star in the draft. (laughs) <laughs> I remember when they were at one like four in a row, we did a pod and um, they actually, but the, what was so good about those four wins was the way they were actually won and how they were playing. And it wasn't just getting wins. And I talked about catching Brooklyn and you mm-hmm. laughed at me at the time in the standings because Brooklyn yeah, was I like did. 10 games over 500 or something. I forget the exact number. And then, we did a pod and about a week later and they had caught Brooklyn, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's how quickly, I mean, Brooklyn was collapsing at the same time, but that's how quickly this thing had turned around. And, um, you know, they went from 18 to 21 to 51 and 31 in the second seed and two games yeah. away from an NBA championship. Mm-hmm. It, it, I, it was just a tremendous run. It was a lot of fun. It was more dominant than people really, I think, remember or realize. Before Rob got hurt, games weren't close. No, they were they, they, they weren't even competitive um, when he was healthy. Uh, they, you know, they were routinely going on the road and having double-digit leads. Um, and the offense, the you know, half. you talk about Tatum. He became a playmaker this year, a really good one when he wasn't before. And it was a big part of why this offense ex- excelled 
and was the second best offense in the league, believe it or not, when the season ended, which is hard to believe considering where they were at 18 and 21. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a sour taste on what happened in the finals, no doubt. But the big picture of this season, they gave us way more than we could ask for. Yeah, there's a, I think a future of this team being in contention for a long time. I, it's uh, they're built to they're built to be in this. Everybody's back. The entire top nine guys, top ten, if you put it throwing Hauser, they're all back. So they're gonna be in it. They're they're built to be successful. They're they're gonna have a great regular season. Again, the hope is that the superstars on this team, you know, take that next step and they're more ready next year when they get to that moment. That's that's what we'll be looking for, right? Yeah, so, I think I think this thing I'm, I'm, I think you hit on it. They're all signed. They're all signed really long term. Um, with the exception exception of Al. This should be a team that can win 60 games and and, and can contend for a, a title next year and into the future. And they have some decisions. You know, you got the Al Horford option they're going to pick up. I think that's the no-brainer of the century. You have the Grant Williams extension, which I actually find kind of interesting on where that's going to land. I think it's going to be more money than people think. Um, I do too. I don't know if I'd give him. But he works for you. He works. He's a four that can shoot the three and defend. During the regular season and in the playoffs, you're going to need it. I know he wasn't great towards the end. But he works for you. This is where you talked about the Warriors resigning their own guys. This is the type of guy has shown improvement. And I think you're going to be looking anywhere between twelve to fifteen million dollars a year on him. I, I really yeah, do. I, the thing the, the only thing with that is I look at a guy like Rob Williams who got that same contract. You might look at that and be like, what the hell am I doing with this contract to make it the same as Grant? But yeah, that's the way it works. You know, it's all about timing. It, you know, it's all about timing and when you your contract mm-hmm. is up, what you decide to do. Rob could have bet on himself. He didn't have to sign that. You he know, and he took security. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I'm sure he's I'm sure he's fine. His family is secure for the next four years, making twelve to thirteen to fourteen million dollars a year. I think as it ends at, and I think you're going to see a similar contract for Grant. Um, I do think they'll extend him. And I think that's what it's going to look at. And, and then you, this is where it gets interesting now. Um, the Celtics, I, I think, need to spend somewhere between 15 and 25 into the tax. Yeah. They have some mechanisms to do that. There's some mm-hmm. trades that can absolutely be made. You're now building to be a championship team. You have a core that's locked up. You know, yeah. This team, if you look at some way, they need help on the bench. They definitely need another wing player. They need someone that can be, you know, help with scoring when there's droughts. So these aren't major tweaks. They're accessories that you're bringing in. But accessories in the NBA are still expensive. And and so you got to go out there and, um, you know, see what's on the market and the trade market. Hopefully, I think the Celtics will need to do, I think he, I could be wrong, but I think you're going to see a trade sooner than later. I wouldn't be surprised on draft night. But shortly thereafter, the Celtics make their first move because before the well, yeah. the league year ends July first, and then contracts kind of get adjusted, mm-hmm. and who you can acquire and who you can't, you know, kind of come into play at that point. Well, I mean, they have to use the TP by the second week of July, right? Yeah, that's yep. when it expires. The Evan Fournier one, yeah. If they got yeah. The big- yeah, that's a big one. That's about eighteen million. Yeah, and remember, they don't have to use all eighteen yeah. million. So they can use any amount of it. Um, yeah. it. There's rules on it, and there's players available that they can go after, and there's players available that maybe they don't use the TPE to get. They they don't have to use the TPE to make trades. They have contracts, um, and they have mm-hmm. ways to do things. I. I but I, I hope the ownership and you hit on it and um, you know finally put their money where their mouth is. You know, you said when you're a championship team, you will spend. Well, it's gonna 
it can't just be four, five, six million into the tax and say, look, I did it. Because uh-huh. that means you're not really improving this team. It's got to be, I think, anywhere between 15 to 25 million, at least. And you, you know that Milwaukee's going to try to improve. You know that Philadelphia and Brooklyn and probably missing a team here in the East. The East is pretty stacked. These teams are going to try to get better. Yeah. And you're hearing, you're hearing whispers in Toronto that some of the players don't want to be there. And they got some good players that fit that TPE in Gary Trent Jr. and o, uh, OG that teams are going to go after, right? I was reading an article the other day saying that the Celtics could try, but a team like Portland's looking to offer the seventh pick of the draft for OG yeah. to come to Portland. There's going to be players, good players available. The Celtics, I, I would like to see the Celtics at least in on all of it. Um, I Do whatever you can to, to get to this next level because it, it's worth it. It could bring you over that. It could it could bring you that championship final. Yeah, I don't know what the Wizards would want to do, but I I'd call about Kuzma. I, I you know I I would and those Kuzma. Are, they should just be making calls and, and even you know, Pope. Yeah, he's another one. How about Pope? So I mean, and there's a yeah. lot of players you can just. I don't know who the player is right now, but there, there is definitely guys. If you call, you, you're going to be able to find somebody. There, there's an opportunity here, um, and and I who knows what the you know, Milwaukee, they don't have to do too much to be in this thing. They just need Middleton healthy, and I'm sure they'll try to make other moves. Um, Brooklyn, it's interesting to see what they're going to do in this offseason. I think there's a lot of questions. You assume Kevin Durant's going to be um, hugely motivated to get back, uh, mm-hmm. but they're also a year older. Philly, there's a lot of question marks there. I, I, you know, James Harden is great. He's going to be a year yeah. older. You yeah, know, yeah. They're usually a second round exit. So I guess yeah. that's what you would count. And then Miami is going to be older. You are set up the best. Uh, you and Milwaukee, those are the two teams that are set up the best to move forward in the East. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. But as you enter this offseason today, you are set up the best. And, and you need to make moves accordingly to do that. You set up the best. But we'll see who's the most aggressive because I could see Pat Riley using Duncan Robinson's c- contract that is horrible and turning that into gold somehow and bringing in some stud that we weren't expecting to go to Miami. So I just, you know, I'm begging ownership. I'm begging you to spend that whole $25 million that we're talking about and getting two guys in here that are quality bench pieces that he may can lean on to get rest these guys because I don't think Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown can lead the NBA in minutes again next. Year. No, you don't want that to happen. You, you need a bench. Um, I, I, I don't think Pat Riley may do something, you know, other teams may do things. You don't have to overreact to it. You, you just need to improve where you need to improve and you're going to be fine. Um, even, no matter what they do, you can still win close to 60 games. Um, and that's what your mentality needs to be right now is, just look at what you need. They, they're trying to catch you. Now, mm-hmm. I, everyone's looking at the Celtics. They're looking at, and, and, you know, maybe with the exception of Milwaukee, it probably still feels like they're the best team in the East. They're looking at you. I mean, Brooklyn has to retool their whole roster outside of Durant. They do. You know, <laughs> I, Philadelphia, you have serious concerns about who you are, your identity, your coach, your second best player. And, and you know, Miami's getting older and, they, they don't. Right, other outside of Duncan Robinson, who I don't think is that um, desired on the market by anybody, a shooter who can't do anything else, I, I who makes eighteen million dollars a year, but, they, yeah. they don't have a lot of tools in the tool shed to make moves. It, it, it's so just focus on what you have to do. Improve this bench. Look for another wing. You know, maybe move Daniel Tice. Uh, bring in a big, those type of things, and you'll be good. You know, you have that six million dollar mid tax player mid level exception. You have the minimum uh-huh. contracts. You have some trades. You got some cute stuff you can do with Hauser. You can basically waive ten through fifteen on your bench. Um, oh, you maybe, you, maybe you bring in a second round pick for salary filler. But this is the big things is improve your weaknesses, lessen the impact on Tatum and Brown, 
because the best thing these guys still have going for them was something that still stands that we talked about in past pods. The two young stars yeah. are going to continue. Uh, one thing I'm better. excited Well, now three young guys, in my opinion. Uh, I, I throw Rob in the mix now. It, it, it's interesting to me, looking at what Brad was able to do last offseason with moving contracts to bringing in you know, guys like Josh Richardson. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just thought these were moves that were Al Horford, obviously, for Kemba Walker. It, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility where he combines Aaron E. Smith and Tice and draft picks to bring in another solid player. So you're right, it's beyond the TPE where we can combine salaries and match salaries to bring in some good talent. It's there. I mean, Peyton Pritchard could be used in a trade. So I fully expect some stuff to happen here. I, I expect Brad to bring I, – I, I like where we're at as far as roster construction goes. And one player I'm really overvalue, valuing, and I'm really hoping the Celtics go after in the offseason. I always have one guy that I'm like really excited for every year. Javon, um, Javon yeah, that's a guy I really want to see. And so, if they were able to move Daniel Tice, and that was our backup center going into next year, I just loved what he did in Phoenix this year as the backup. I loved what he did in Golden State on their run. Uh, he was he was a double double guy coming off the bench in Phoenix, and I just think to have a guy like that who's won championships, who's really athletic and can score around the rim. I feel like he's the perfect backup to Rob, where Rob and Al are going to have to miss a lot of games next year. So the last last thing I'll say as we move forward into this offseason now, it's a lot easier when you're kind of a middling team and you're trying to find pieces that are going to kind of overachieve and do some things for you, like last offseason, a lot of way for the Celtics. It sounds, we've made it sound simple. It's a lot harder to find those right pieces to be, you know, championship complimentary players this is what the one thing the Celtics have going for them mm-hmm. they have about seven guys that fit that bill right now they need to find eight and nine and maybe ten to fill up this roster and that gets a little difficult um I mean, we'll make it sound simple but identifying that right player to come in here and not just help you during the regular season but make an impact in the playoffs not easy I agree. So that's the next step for Coach Adoka, his staff, and Brad and his staff as they evaluate talent to make this team better for next year. And speaking of, Jim, you know, I just want to thank our listeners for a second season of Celtic basketball. Obviously, this season was a lot more fun than last year, and I hope it'll be a fun off season. We'll have a couple shows to kick off season three, probably around the draft, and then you know, when free agencies kicked off or Celtics make their moves, we'll have a pod. Uh, but we h- really hope you guys listen again for season three and uh, that you all enjoy your summer. All right, guys. Take care. Thanks for everyone. Bye-bye.